am so happy to be here and so happy to see all of you in the audience and so many friends and uh, it's just wonderful to be here in Middlebury. I've been thinking about giving this talk, of course, for the past six months nonstop. And uh, every day I wake up, uh, or have woken up in the past six months, and you know, take a little look at the headlines in terms of what's been going on with our two presidential candidates, because I'm kind of interested in who's running the country, and I think we all are. So we had an election on Tuesday, and on Wednesday morning, when we all woke up, I think that an awful lot of us said, I don't believe it. And honestly, I mean, I said that, but I also think that Kellyanne Conway, Donald Trump's uh, campaign manager, with whom I am totally obsessed, and you should be too, just to understand how this woman works, she didn't believe it either. No one did. But I have news for you guys. It happened. So the next thing I said to myself is, we're all here. The world is still here. This miraculous orb in the middle of the solar system, or the middle of my solar system, sorry to be so self-referential. It is glorious, isn't it? And in my lifetime, we've been able to put people on the moon and in outer space all over the place, and we can look back at ourselves. Now, this gives us an extraordinary perspective. And I'm hoping that today, as I talk about the game of our lives and another little obsession that I have, which is with our planet and what's going on with that planet because of us, and I mean all of us, I'm going to try to leave you with a few ways that are new and refreshing to think about this because that election focused us, I think, on the things that we care about the most in this world. And beyond just our children, and I don't mean to say just our children, our mere children, I love my children more than anything in the world. I'm very excited someday to be a grandmother. But I sure as hell don't want those kids to grow up in a world that the smartest, nerdiest, Nobel prizing, winningest scientists say is going to be absolutely catastrophic if we don't stop spewing carbon into the atmosphere. So, an American presidential election is a great example of a game. You've got winners and losers, you've got victories and defeats, you've got contests, you've got those debates, you've got points, you've got the Electoral College, uh, you've got red, you've got blue. <laughs> it really is a game, isn't it? Only, actually, it wasn't a game at all because this is the life that we live and this is the world that we live in. And I've got news for you that for all the intractable and really worthy, horrendous, difficult problems to gnaw on in this world, and they can be terribly, terribly important and painful, um, and there's no end to them. If we don't have a place to live, well, we might as well be little squirmy amoeba, right? So. The way I see it, about the fourth thing I said on Wednesday after I woke up to my dear husband was, you know what? Mother Nature doesn't give a crap about us. We can continue to send all this carbon into the atmosphere. That's fine with her, but she's gonna continue doing what our scientists say she's gonna do. And so people are gonna go from where we are now to that scenario in any one of several ways. Kicking and screaming, um, fingers in their ears, a little more about that later. Different people have different attitudes on this. And in the election, one of the things that I found to be most confounding that became almost a rule, if you will, to continue on the theme of the game of our lives is that people began to ask each other whether or not they believed in climate change. Now, that's like asking, do you believe in hemoglobin? 
Or do you believe that if you leave your bread out on the counter for 16 days, it's going to get stale? Because you know, if you don't believe the facts, then actually you aren't playing in that game. You're going to get trounced. So the situation is actually pretty clear, the scientists say. I'm an English major, as you've heard, so I don't really even honestly know what a kilowatt is. But I do know that we have a simple equation here. And it is that we are putting too much carbon into the sky. OK? And that ends up in the atmosphere. And who would want to mess with that? I ask you now to feast your eyes on our atmosphere. It is that glorious, glimmery, shimmery. You couldn't possibly, I mean, could you make me a scarf of the atmosphere? It's beautiful. Who would ever want to tamper with that? But guess what? That's what we're doing. And wishing that we weren't isn't going to make that go away. The atmosphere has had enough, and it is sick of us doing this. And our scientists say that we are now entering danger zones. Tipping, tipping points are occurring, and there's going to be, I hate to say this, but this is what I'm reading and seeing them say, we're going to get to some points of no return. For example, once the ice sheets melt, well, they aren't going to freeze back up again. <laughs> So once the ice sheets start really melting in a cataclysmic type of way, as they are, then sea level rise becomes an issue. Now, I live on Boston Harbor on the ninth floor of an enormous apartment building. And I think pretty soon I'm going to be able to tie up a boat to the balcony. So I'm worried about this on a very personal level, but I'm also worried about it on a global level. I'm not saying that you have to be too. I'm just trying to explain to you what gets me about this fascinating issue. More about that in a minute. It turns out that 70% of Americans actually do understand that global warming is happening, that simple equation that I showed you. And however, only 17% of us are urgently concerned about it. And the large majority of us really don't want to talk about it. We say, no. We say, no, 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 no. We don't want to talk about that. Why? Well, it's depressing. We're talking about, like, the end of the world, maybe. Um, and it's also scary. But I would also tell you that winners do not dwell on losers. So if we're going to lead on this, we're going to need to put ourselves into a winning mindset. Look for opportunities and understand who the opponent is. So I did a little exercise here. I made this slide. This is a Serafini Robinson original. And I was just curious to see whether anyone ever searches for global warming. That's on the left up there, if you can see it, blue. Well, you'll see in the past two years, it's that flat line. <laughs> Not too much interest, everybody. So then I put in tennis. Tennis is the red line. Now, we got a bunch of people interested in tennis. And then so I put in pizza. Well, of course, everyone's interested in pizza. So that is the yellow line up there. Now, you can go and, and look and, and see what your variables would be. But as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday, and you're going to be sitting around the table possibly with your crazy Uncle Harry, and you want to know, like, how would I even talk to this person? And you don't want to ruin everything from your, for your mother on Thanksgiving Day. Trust me on that one. Uh, so we need to do a much better job on communicating, everybody. And I think we need to own this for ourselves, stop preaching, start being a little bit more witty and charming, if you can possibly be that way. And I'll give you some tips at, at the end on exactly some ideas that you can do, starting absolutely today. 
The big idea is that we can all be worried uh, and concerned about this planet of ours. And as far as I'm concerned, we've only got one. And I've said that before, I call it planet A, and there is no planet B. I'm not going to Mars, and I don't think you guys are either. And I certainly don't want my grandchildren growing there, because I like to see them on Christmas morning, even though they aren't born yet. So we're in a race against time. I have swallowed an alarm clock, and I suggest you all do too. And I think we can handle it. And we've got the technology and the people and the uh, agreements and the chutzpah to actually move ourselves to a new clean energy world. But it's going to take a little bit of work and attention. And it's going to take each other. Meantime, tick, tick, tick. We have reports all the time about uh, how we are going into a danger zone. It's um, hurricanes. It's just really crazy storms. And there's another obsession. I think if you're ever we're interested in extreme weather, just turn on the news at night, and you'll see some stunning examples of what's going on. These storms are going to become more and more plentiful. They're very, very expensive. Um, they're causing people to lose their livelihoods. They're causing people to lose their agricultural uh, abilities. This is an area in China that has become desertified. That's a new word for me um, in the past decade or so. So you've got people underwater and really starting to add up in terms of money. Entire uh, businesses and industries are having to really rethink the way that they have done business. For example, the insurance business. Of course, standing water, such as you see here, um, can't, is not fit to be, to be drunk. And also, who loves multiplying in standing water? Well, mosquitoes. So that's a topic for another day, but there are public health issues here. And it's not only our sanity that's at stake, but uh, you know, when you start to advise women not to become pregnant, maybe put that off and maybe not go to Miami for New Year's this year, that's beginning to get to a broader public. And I think that we're going to be able to see some, some changes happening. But again, it doesn't have to be so harsh and brutal. I think that we can all get involved and be helpful here, remembering and be humbled by the, the clear concept that Mother Nature does not favor the wealthy and the well-connected. And even if you live on the ninth floor of a big building on Boston Harbor, or God forbid, the 55th floor of Trump Tower, this is going to affect you. Um, now, for you and me, uh, and for many people, it might mean, hey, we can't go to the Louvre in Paris um, this June because they had to move all the collections up to the attic because they're flooded in the Louvre. Or we can't go skiing in Vermont this year because there's no more snow in Vermont, so let's go somewhere else. So these are first world problems. But what happens if actually you have to move without any credit card or smartphone or really a pot to piss in. What happens then? What happens to all of these people? We're shattering heat records. Our climate is changing. Our world is changing. Where are all these people going to go? And who's to say who, who gets to survive and who doesn't? Wildfires occur when things are dry. And so we had, even here in New England this summer, epic drought. And fire marshals around the states in New England were very concerned about the lack of rainfall and about their ability to fight these fires. They're ripping through their budgets um, five times faster than they usually did. This particular photograph is of a place in Alberta, Canada, that burned to hell. And 80,000 people had to evacuate there. So imagine what this is like for someone who really doesn't even have a bed and who doesn't even have a, an electric plug or a wall to put that plug into and who really, if somebody says, hey, here's an air conditioner, is going to use that air conditioner regardless of whether it's releasing all kinds of other junk into the air, 
Well, of course they're going to do that. They need a good night's sleep too. Their kids do too, so that they can, they can go to school, they can go to college. Maybe they can even come to Middlebury. So who are we to tell them that they can't have all that stuff that we've been enjoying that has gotten us into so much trouble here? So I ask you, that's where we have a new phrase. It's called climate justice and we are all connected. So, I say, enough. I've had it. And I've decided to join the winners, and that's why I'm so glad to be part of the solution here. And it isn't easy, and it's sometimes frustrating, and however, there are so many solutions even at big financial institutions like J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Citi. I will tell you that even the Dow Jones has a sustainability index and investors are investing in companies and calling to heal the large corporations that really are not adhering to their commitments to reduce their carbon emissions. This is going on and regardless of who is the president, the Fortune 500 is on board. So, when we made the transition from horse and buggy to cars, did the people who were in charge of the buggy whips scream and yell? Well, yes, they did. Well, that's just too bad for them. So, they had to go out of business or they had to figure out something new to do. When you live with a winner, whether it's an athlete or a best-selling author or an actress, you learn that they've got a different way of looking at the world. They're always in training. They very rarely fall off the wagon. They're always gathering data points. So in the case of a climate scientist, it would be metrics, analytics, data on uh, ice core or on you know, exact temperature changes or wind currents. Champions are obsessed with variables like this. So that's one thing that I've learned to do is to continually just be a rabid, devouring monster on every bit of data I can get. And you will find that a lot of these climate scientists and professors are really intent on helping us all understand so that we can tell the story better and spread the word. So in order to have the kind of world that we all might like to have with clean energy and health and sanity and with everyone having access to the conveniences of a, of a modern world, um, we're gonna want to really pay attention to what's going on with companies like Tesla, for example, and the investments in renewables that we see happening all over the world and around us, green building infrastructure. You all have access to all of this. You're very fortunate. So go find out, you know, what, what, is, what is that big belching building that you have over there called the Recycling Center? What's it doing? What are the impacts of that? It's all on, on the Middlebury website. It's really quite extraordinary. And it's one reason why I'm so proud of my affiliation to this great college. We mustn't let this get us. And the stakes could not be higher. So like it or not, we have the perilous fortune to have been born right now. And this is our moment. And this is what's going on. So I ask each of you, and I'm sorry to say the word so, so much, but what are each of you going to do? And you don't have to answer that today. I hope I'm just planting a seed because, you know, tonight when you look up at the moon, you'll see it's a full moon. How do I know that? Because last month at this time it was a full moon and the month before that it was a full moon too. We actually scheduled my daughter's wedding on that very night because it would be a full moon. And we scheduled that 15 months earlier than that because we knew that was the Saturday in the month of September that would be a full moon. Is that not awesome? That's nature, everybody. So 
we're smaller than that. And we've got to start respecting the kind of rhythms and patterns that we see unfolding all around us all year, every day, every minute of every day. And if that isn't enough to get you out of bed in the morning, I don't know what is. Right now, what we're doing is we're driving toward a cliff at 90 million miles an hour. And guess what? We're going to just fly right off that cliff and go if we don't all start paying more attention to this. It's inevitable. In the end, it has to do with all of us wanting the change. So I invite you again to think about what you can do. Now, this woman, she gets it. Her whole house, she, she's, she's up to her waist in water. So she understands now. This guy clinging to a signpost, he gets it now. Maybe he didn't before. So it is the game of our lives, everybody. Here's a mantra you could use, no waste. Just think about that. Now, next time you brush your teeth, next time you wash your hands, do you really need to leave that faucet running the entire time? Trust me, I did this willy-nilly for years, for decades. Didn't think about it, not, not, for, not a bit. But now I do, and I think you will too if you just start getting in the habit of it. And then I would think, where do you have clout? Where do you have influence in your life? You know, you might have little brothers and sisters. Kids are really good at bugging their grandparents. So if you do, and you see them over at Thanksgiving, tell them, sick them on your, on your dad or on that crazy Uncle Harry of yours. Because kids understand what's going on, and they have a way of being able to change the bad habits of the adults in their lives. Start where you are. You know, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're an accountant, maybe you're a photographer, maybe you're an investor. Uh, Wherever you are, you have a chance to plug climate every once in a while. Not by being obnoxious, but you know, just figure out a way to kind of get it in there. You'll have fa uh, data, you'll have facts to use, um, so use them. If you're ready to get a new car, maybe consider an electric car. Or consider not getting a car at all. Maybe you don't need one. Maybe we all don't need so much. Maybe that word enough can be a new word that we can all believe in. So I want to thank you all so, so very much. I've really enjoyed being here today. And I hope that I've given you just a little bit of factual information in a way that you can take it, act on it, and believe yourself to be true. Thanks. <laughs>